Let them fight. Let, 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 let them fight. I like boobs. Hi, and welcome back to the inside of my head, where we're recapping the legendary MonsterVerse movies ahead of the release of Godzilla vs. Kong. And up next is King of the Monsters! As I said in my last vid, and I think I'm just agreeing with the general consensus here, the good parts of Godzilla 2014 were great, but they were constantly interrupted by a bunch of generic filler. And judging by the trailer for King of the Monsters, that's an issue they've sought to remedy. So let's check it out! We start off with Bruce Wayne seeing the Kryptonian battle from the ground, and I'm joking, but it's exactly the same idea. It's literally the same. Except it's not Batman vs Superman, it's Godzilla vs this guy. Anyway, we start in the San Francisco hellscape from the first movie, seeing the battle against the Mutos from the point of view of Emma and Mark Russell, whose young son Andrew was killed in the attack. Then it cuts to Monarch being strung up in court for some reason, I guess because they kept it all a secret and people might have been better prepared if it was all out in the open, but... I mean, one news reporter says that trying to find Godzilla is the reason that loads of animals are dying? Recent spike in mass die-offs in the world's oceans could be caused by efforts to locate and track Godzilla. How? I don't- how is- how is- Anyway, the tide of public opinion definitely seems to have changed, with most people now seemingly want to nuke the Titans. What happened to the saviour of our city, hey? Anyway, in the middle of this rainforest in China, Emma Russell now works for Monarch, and has just finished building this. It's called the Orca device, and they hope that it will help them communicate with the monsters. Anyway, she's stationed here because inside this pyramid thing right here is everyone's favorite Titanus Mosura, or Mothra, and she's about to break out of her spore. Of course, this is still the lava form of Mothra, but it's still pretty devastating when it gets spooked and starts spitting webs everywhere. Perfect time to test the Orca device then. So Emma runs out there with the Orca device and Mothra manages to miss her with its widespread web spray, not once, but twice, even though Emma is crouched directly in front of it. Need some practice with your aim there, Mothra. But don't worry, Mothra, we all need practice, you know, aiming with our bodily fluid, did ya? No, bodily fluid, did Bodily fluid. I can't say it, I can't say that, there are kids watching, alright? And luckily, she gets the Orca device to work before the lava eats her whole and Mothra chills her then Tywin Lannister walks in and ruthlessly kills some supporting characters, much like he's been doing his whole acting career. Never stop, never stopping, Tywin. Just, you keep on killing those supporting characters. You go, girl. Wait, did I just say go, girl to f***ing Tywin Lannister? Once he's murdered enough innocent supporting characters, Tywin buggers off with Emma and her daughter. Meanwhile, Mark is watching dogs eat each other when he's picked up and told that his family has been kidnapped and that the bad guys have the Orca device. Surizawa tells us that to date, there are 17 different species of Titan that have been found. Most are in hibernation, other are uncontained, but 17? I mean, wow, that's a lot. I mean, whew. Then they go to another monarch outpost on an oil rig. Yes, another one. How many of these things are there? Allow me to answer that question, me. Oh, thanks, me. I'd love you to. Well, me, the answer to that question is an absolute shitload. Thanks, me. You're welcome, me. Bye, me. I fucking hate you, me. And yes, the technology in this movie has taken a huge leap. And that's one of the big differences in this movie. In the first movie, Monarch felt like a few guys working out of a forgotten basement office somewhere. But in this movie, they're pretty much the MIB. <laughs> Tywin kills a bunch more innocents at Monarch Outpost, frees your balls off. And then he celebrates the murders by making silly faces at this kid. Oh, blah, 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 blah. you tell him Millie Billy Bob Thornton. Hey, oh yeah, I might have forgotten to mention, but the kid from Stranger Things is in this movie. And flipping this guy the bird is honestly her first meaningful contribution to the movie and maybe her last. And I'm not saying her last because she's about to die, just simply because she does absolutely nothing. Like that cactus your grandma bought you last time she went to the garden center. It kind of just sits on the windowsill. You don't have to water it or anything. It just, it's just there. It doesn't do anything. It's just f***ing there. You can't throw it out the f***ing window. You can't kick it across the room. It's just there. Being a pointy little f***ing that f***ing stares you in the face every f***ing day. And if you go near it, it'll f***ing stab you. What's the f***ing point of this thing? Why does it exist? Why did God make this pointy little f*** that keeps stabbing me in my f***ing fingers? I could just chuck it in the bin, but it would use those pointy things to f***ing poke holes in the bin bag. And then all the other would leak out and they would still have the last laugh and on top of that i'd feel bad for chucking my grandma's cactus out does the thing grow at all does it eat so here's Ghidorah, and it got frozen in some ice how don't know and considering the ice usually takes quite a while to form it must have been not unconscious at the time but you know who the 
Come on, the CSI frozen dragon unit? Seriously, she bought it with her little pension money and she asks me about it every time she visits. She's like, ooh, how's the cactus? And I'm like, it's exactly the same as last time. It just- Tywin orders his lackeys to start drilling Monster Zero out. Why? Oh God, why would you want to do this? I mean, look at this thing. Just look at the, the silhouette here. Look at it and think to yourself, whatever half-baked scheme you've baked up, it will not go the way you want it to. Look at it. Even if you want to destroy the world and cause mass chaos, this is literally the most unpredictable way of doing it. Oh, I just, I need to take a breath here. Anyway, Godzilla eventually tracks the Orca to Antarctica and the Monarch guys follow in their giant stealth bomber that looks like the mothership from Ring Raiders. I know I keep mentioning Ring Raiders, but it's, you know, something from my youth. And the mothership really does look like this. There's a mention of Hollow Earth theory, something that's going to become important in the franchise, that there are these underground tunnels and passageways deep underneath the Earth. And that is not only where all these creatures have been hiding all these years, but they can also use them as little conduits to get from one location to another very, very quickly. Anyway, just as this guy is about to get his wife and kid back, the wife, Emma, turns to the dark side and blows Ghidorah out of the ice. And even with the ludicrousness of this situation, which up until this point I've been happily suspending my disbelief and going along with, this decision is so stupefying, it nearly knocked me into comatose. There had better be some good reasoning behind this, lady. Then she uses the Orca device to wake him up. What are you waiting for? Wake it up. Okay. And yep. Thanks very much, lady. Anyway, Ghidorah wakes up and in some shots, he looks awesome. In others, he kind of looks like the dragons from Dungeons and Dragons. Rain from but then he does this and... Oh, shit. Holy shit. Shit, you felt the power of that attack. But then, everything goes quiet, and there's a blip on the radar, followed by some lights under the ice, and... <laughs> Holy falafel balls, this guy knows how to make an entrance. And um, it looks like these two don't like each other because Godzilla grabs hold of one of the dragon heads and slams it into the ground before charging his atomic blast. And wait a second, it feels like in the last five or six minutes, there's more action than in the whole of the last movie combined. I mean, I know that that can't be true but there's so much going on suddenly that I'm struggling to keep up. Anyway, the fish shagger from Shape of Water is eaten and Ghidorah flies off into the sky faced with the combined might of the Ring Raiders mobile and Godzilla who's found his way out of some hole that he'd fallen into. And it's time for this woman to finally explain her plan. And you know what? This had better be good. And oh my God, I am just now seeing how scary this still is. It looks like she's looking right at me as if to say your criticism have pushed me slightly past breaking point i am currently beyond what psychological help can do and in this life or the next i am going to find you and flay your penis she explains that actually releasing the titans to sow bloody and visceral carnage is actually a good thing because it's people that are killing the planet with their pollution and general dumb f***ery and the titans will restore balance by killing a couple billion of them off, I suppose. Apparently everywhere the titans have destroyed has been restored with natural life because radioactivity, woo. What a crock of shit. It's basically Thanos' plan to wipe out half the life in the universe so there's more resources to go around, but with titans instead of infinity stones. Oh, wait, no, I've watched it again and it's even stupider than that. Basically her plan is step one, release all the monsters. Step two, Step three, Earth rejuvenates. Oh, I get it. No, you don't, fat ass. But what they don't realize at this point is that you need a benevolent alpha like Godzilla to sort of police the other Titans and stop them killing people. But if you've got an evil alpha like Ghidorah, I mean, it's mainly ridiculous because of how little we know about these monsters at this stage. The chances must be like literally 90% that you release these monsters and they just go absolutely batshit haywire. So she releases all of the monsters out of their hibernation or captivity or wherever it is they've been. And Rodan pops out of a volcano and he has woken up grouchy. They try to lure Rodan into the path of Monster Zero in the hope that the two will kill each other, I guess. But it doesn't work because... 
There's some really cool stuff in this sequence. Obviously the shockwave that follows Rodan, this do a barrel roll thing. And I love the glowing, burning bits along the edges of his wings. Ghidorah appearing out of the clouds looks sublime, often appearing as little more than a silhouette with these glowing yellow eyes. I still would have liked to have seen more of the actual fight itself though, because this time we cut away to the stealth bomber and this, there's this Osprey trying to make an emergency landing. Godzilla saves the humans from Ghidorah before the oxygen destroyer missile succeeds in killing loads of fish, like a hell of a lot of fish. Oh, and Godzilla as well, but not Ghidorah, who takes his place as the alpha predator. So once again, the human's plan of just simply throwing a nuke into the mix and hoping for the best does exactly the opposite of what they hoped it would. Well done, humans. I mean, we are the species that invented math and logic and music and culture, right? Is there nothing we can come up with better than just, well, we've got these big rockets. Anyway, Ghidorah takes his place as the alpha predator and there are some gorgeous shots here. Look at some of these, they're incredible. Uh, Ghidorah sends out a call and Titans start popping up all over the shop. Mothra hatches and I don't really get their reactions here. Look at these guys, what's he smiling at? Do they know that Mothra is benevolent at this stage? Ghidorah turns out to be an alien that fell from space. Then what's her face comes to this realization. With Godzilla gone, Monster Zero isn't using the Titans to restore the planet. He is using them to destroy it. You don't say. Anyway, Tywin doesn't really give a shit because a lifetime in the military has turned him into a shriveled sack of bitterness and bile and god damn this guy is a good fucking actor. He has genuine presence in a kind of a thespian sort of way, but you can see why he's had a whole career of playing evil bastards. He's pretty scary. So what's her face does a complete U-turn and comes up with a plan to use the Boston Red Sox Stadium to amplify the Orca device signal and try and stop the attacks. And again, I don't get her thinking here. This guy just about makes sense because he seems to think that the chaos and destruction is a means to an end, no matter the cost. It's like she goes, yeah, let's release the things to destroy the world and then goes, oh no, hold on, they're destroying the world. The fuck? Anyway, Mothra calls to Godzilla and turns out he's not dead after all. So they get a sub and off to see the wizard and detonate a thermonuclear device in his face. And Sherizawa and this guy have this deep personal conversation and every time you see a scene like this, you know someone is going bye-bye. Game of Thrones did this tons of times where a character opens up and shares something he's never told anyone before. He gets you to see the real them, bond with them, and then BAM! Horrible, gruesome death straight to the face. They find a sunken city of some kind where Godzilla goes to regenerate in the radiation rich atmosphere. But because him regenerating is a process that could potentially take years, Surisawa volunteers to take the nuke down there and set it off. And I told you so. Straight to the face. He says goodbye to his colleagues. And wait, who the f are you, woman? I feel like they binned off the fish shagger who's actually a really good actress and just did a straight swap for somebody who fit the target demographic better. Addendum. Addendum. And what I mean by that is because Legendary is at least co-owned by some big Chinese corporation and it's mostly Chinese money that has financed this, probably, they're really trying to make this appeal to the Chinese market. Surisawa dies and it's a pretty poignant moment. I guess because at heart he was just a Godzilla fanboy like most of us here are. And to see him struggling with that fucking bomb and finally getting to touch the creature he'd spent his whole life studying and even look at it straight in the eye, it's a pretty nice moment. Anyway, did it work? <laughs> fucking right it did. And here he is with one of his trademark entrances and wait, is he standing on something here? What, what is he, what is he st One second ago we were in a sunken city this close to the Earth's core. I mean, when I like a movie, I generally tend to let these things slide, but there's a few things in this movie that it's tough. It's, I'm trying to let them slide, but it's hard. Anyway, it's time for the big showdown at the Red Sox Stadium. Ghidorah arrives in his own personal storm cloud and starts nuking shit at random with his lightning breath. And he's about to do the same to Billy Bobby Bobby, Billy Millie Bobby, whatever, uh, when it's struck by an atomic blast. Yes! And Godzilla and Ghidorah rush together and slam together so hard it's, the impact sends out a shockwave and here we go, this is gonna be our- Wait, this shit again? I feel like whoever was in charge of storyboarding or whatever is just like laughing at us here. Anyway, just to make things a little bit more complicated, this guy says that Godzilla has absorbed so much radiation now that on top of everything, he's gonna explode in a few minutes. Ah! 
Mothra shows up and webs King Ghidorah's head to a building before Godzilla rams it straight through, and that's pretty awesome. Now, with Mothra in the equation, it looks like the odds have tipped in Godzilla's favor. But nope, Rodan shows up and gets involved, and mind your business, Rodan, what's the matter with you? Anyway, Mothra spikes Rodan with a stinger, which I think is new, right? I don't remember seeing Mothra have a stinger ever before. Which I think was a good call, because I mean, naturally, a moth is not the most aggressive, scary animal, right? So it's good that they gave us some teeth. Not literally teeth, but you know what I mean. Ghidorah does this awesome attack where it absorbs electricity from a pylon and then zaps it out of its wingtips and then picks up Godzilla and flies him halfway to the f***ing moon before dropping him. And the big guy looks nigh on defeated until Mothra makes the ultimate sacrifice and turns into the Aurora Borealis to provide the big guy with extra radiation. He's still a tad groggy though and Ghidorah gets in there and puts him in a chokehold. I mean, look at this. I mean, it reminds me of this Thai massage I once had where I couldn't figure out whether I was being attended to by a masseuse or a f***ing MMA fighter. Then the humans finally do something useful and reprogram the second Orca device which distracts Ghidorah for just long enough for the big guy to get back on his feet. This woman draws Ghidorah away and sacrifices herself and she's getting jack in the way of sympathy from me as the entirety of this situation is completely entirely her fault. Ghidorah is about to crunch her like a smarty when she has this one cool line. Long live the king. And then yes, this is the bit we've all been waiting for. Please don't disappoint me. I really don't have much to live for other than this. And oh my god, all the buildings are melting, and no, oh, you're in trouble now, you three-headed f***ing worm, and even if it's lightning attack does jack shit to this pulsating angry thermo-titan, and he stomps its living guts out, prompting an epic nuclear blast. But as the dust settle, Ghidorah rises once more, but no, it's just his severed head hanging out of Zilla's snack hole, and Zilla atomic blast it, obliterating it to f***ing ashes. And all the bullshittery of the plot is forgiven. I don't care because that was brilliant. All the other titans show up to bow down to the reinstated king. We see a Muto, the spider monster thing. Rodan shows up and Zilla's like, I don't can trust you. I'm going to keep my eye on you. And he's just like, and he's just like, he just has this sneaky star scream thing about him, you know, like the, to Zilla's face. He's all like, oh, hey, almighty Zilla. But he'd stab him in the back as soon as he had the opportunity. Anyway, Zilla is like, right, you better bow. You ain't worth a fraction of Mothra, you piece of shit. Anyway, Zilla roars and that's it. There are some interesting bits of information in the credit sequence, shown as newspaper headlines. A couple of them deal with how the new Titans have kind of gone back to where they came from, like Rodan's gone back to his volcano or whatever. Most of them kind of reinforce that Godzilla is the key item here to keep all of the other Titans in check. And by doing so, somehow that allows the coexistence between the Titans and humans and, and also allows for the restoration and the rejuvenation of the planet. Here we've got one about the behemoth titan, restoring deforested regions of the Amazon. That's the woolly mammoth one. Here's one about prehistoric plants maybe being the new superfood. There's even one here about how titan waste could be a really good energy source. And I mean, like, what are they doing with it? Are they, are they burning it or are they, are they shoveling it into nuclear reactors? Has Elon Musk made a car that runs on titan shit or, or what? There's an interesting one here about how ancient hollow earth humans once coexisted with Titans. Maybe that's the undersea city that we saw, you know, where Sur Surizawa died. But I wouldn't be surprised if in Godzilla vs. Kong they expand on this further and, and it turns out that there was a whole other human race that lived in, you know, in the catacombs down there or something. And then there's a few headlines about them detecting mysterious seismic activity on Skull Island and all of the new Titans are being drawn there for some reason, so Monarch reacts by sending more troops there to reinforce. So that's pretty intriguing. And then of course, after the credits, we get the scene with Tywin Lannister and he finds the Ghidorah head there, which um, how that survived, I'm not entirely sure, but he says, I like boobs. Uh, I mean, he says, we'll take it. So what's he gonna do? Does he just want it for study? Is he gonna clone Ghidorah? Is he somehow gonna use it to make Mechagodzilla? Or is he just gonna hang it up on his wall like a big trophy alongside all the heads of the supporting characters he's murdered? Who knows? So what about the big question? Did they give us more of what we were yearning for after the first movie? Big time. Yes. Big yes. They also try to break up what could be seen as a slightly depressing and miserable tone in the first movie, with little injections of humor here and there. And whilst all this does make the movie much more fun, it also makes it a bit of a mess, with the plot becoming very much secondary priority. So whilst on paper anyway, I find the first movie to be much better, this is probably the one that I'll end up re-watching more often, because it's just more fun. 
Anyway, let me know which one you preferred below, and make sure to tell me why in glorious, hideous, explicit, visceral detail. Thank you so much for watching. If you're not subscribed already, make sure you hit that button. And I'm going to get cracking on Kong Skull Island. I don't know if there's going to be time to get it done before GVK comes out, but who the hell knows when that's coming out anyway. If not, I might jump onto GVK straight away and then come back to Kong Skull Island. But regardless, you guys know the drill right now. You know where the door is. Get out of my head and I will see you very soon for the next one. Thank you very much for watching. Cheerio. Bye.